Hello, I'm Lisa and this is Scene on 7 on WMTV. Here's Steve Brennan. Hello and welcome to this week's Scene on 7. My name is Steve Brennan and in a packed programme today, our intrepid reporter Bubble Mitchell live in the studio telling us about nightclub aerobics. Yes, really. Sergeant Paul Colson has this week's police file and a special report on the BT burger alarm system. Tony O'Rourke has a story on table tennis for the disabled. Steve Williams treads the hallowed turf at Twickenham with the Rugby Football Union president, Ian Beer. Snapshots of a press photographer. Who's at the Mirage this Christmas? Could it be Simon Brandt? And I'm particularly delighted this week to have some guests in the studio. It gets lonely here. My first guest today is Bubba Mitchell, who's joining the team. Welcome, Bubba. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about what you're going to be doing uh, on Scene on 7. Well, my particular area of interest is women's issues, basically. Anything that covers women and things that are going to interest them. For example, we've got uh, car safety for women coming up soon. And we'll also be looking at women and crises at Christmas and the pressures that Christmas can put on women. And we're going to be looking at things like osteoporosis in women and how, can, how to avoid it and um, what sort of steps you can take if you're suffering from that particular area of concern for women in, in health issues. So it's those kind of things, just anything and everything that covers women, basically. Right, and this week's program, um, you've got an, uh, an item where you went to the Mirage, I understand. That's right, yes. Saturday night fever meets aerobics, basically. The mind boggle. <laughs> Tell us more. <laughs> it was more. good fun. It was great fun. We went along to basically see the latest craze in aerobics that is sweeping through America and has hit England with a passion. And um, basically what happens is people take out nightclubs and do aerobics in nightclubs and have great fun doing it. On a normal club evening? On a normal club evening. They're tending to put them at the beginning of the week, Sundays and Mondays and Tuesdays. When the clubs are empty. When the clubs aren't quite so full as they might be at the weekend. Yeah, exactly. And um, doing aerobics nights. Sounds great. Here's Bubba's report. <laughs> Club in Windsor to discover the latest thing in aerobics. Slide aerobics. Okay, well, slide aerobics is a very new and innovative form of health and fitness. Um, <clears throat> it's a very high intensity workout which is non impact, so you don't get the stresses going through the skeletal system as you would do if you were jogging or stepping. Primarily, it works the inner and the outer thigh and also builds up the cardiovascular system which burns fat. It's a very intense exercise. And is, what's the difference between this and step aerobics then? Well, step aerobics primarily um, concentrates on the front and back, back plane. So basically you're exercising the front of the leg and the back of the leg.
tell us exactly what it's all about? Right, well, what happens normally is um, uh, an organisation hires a nightclub um, for the evening for about three or four hours. Um, then you have presenters, uh, aerobics instructors, that teach a class each, normally about 40 minutes to an hour, 40, 45 minutes. Um, normally the emphasis is on dance, so it's dance aerobics, very funky styles. Normally the people that teach at the nightclub events are funky types of people. Um, they're, they're happening all over London at the moment and they're starting to go outside London as well. But normally the emphasis is on fun. idea of the nightclub aerobics, these sort of like the disco music with the aerobics. I think it's a, a brilliant concept but I think, and a big space to have a, and, and I don't know, you feel a bit more like dancing in a nightclub scene than maybe just a studio or a gym. It's, it's great fun, um, good exercise as well, and you get to work out in, in a club atmosphere. You get the disco lights, you get the, the music, and you get the dance feel as well. I think it's a brilliant idea, absolutely fantastic. And I think this girl is amazing, really good. She's going to go far. <laughs> like fun, doesn't it? Bubba, did you take part yourself? I have to admit that I didn't. I got pretty exhausted just watching it, actually. She did look pretty fit, the instructor, I must say. Yeah, there were quite a few fit people around. <laughs> Good. Well, thanks, Bob. We look forward to the, your next report uh, with great interest. This week, yet again, police file, unfortunately, has some disturbing reports of violence against the elderly and burglaries in our area. They seem to be on the increase. From Thames Valley Police, here's Sergeant Paul Coulson. Thank you, Steve. Welcome to Police File, I'm Paul Coulson. In Windsor at 7.45pm on Saturday the 13th of November, the following person forced the front door of a house belonging to an 82-year-old woman. He fled when she challenged him. He's a white male, 40 years old, 6 foot tall, slim build with short brown hair. He was wearing blue jeans, a shirt and a beige jacket. Fortunately, nothing was... If you have any ideas as to the offender, please contact us. Similarly, two attempts were also made in Horton and Datchet, respectively, on Thursday the 11th of November and Friday the 12th of November. It was late afternoon, early evening, when between three and five males tried to enter elderly persons' homes. On both occasions, the offenders left when challenged. We've no descriptions except that they were gypsy types. This is a reminder here to be a good neighbour, especially if you live next door to older folk. Between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. on Wednesday the 10th of November, a flat in Armour Road, Windsor, was entered. The offender or offenders gaining access via a security door. Hi-fi equipment, a fax and a video, total value £2,000 was stolen. A red Volkswagen Golf Mark I model was seen in the area. Was it yours or did it belong to the offender or offenders? If you saw anything, please call us. And now we go over to Vicky Evans and Bob Tuck of Telecom Red, who are going to show us the Red Care system, which involves burglar alarm systems. Vicky and Bob. Thank you, Paul. Red Care from BT is an alarm signalling network. Put very briefly, that is the means of sending an alarm message from premises with an alarm system to an alarm company monitoring station. 
who will then take the appropriate action, calling out the police, whatever is necessary. Redcare works over a BT line and provides continuous monitoring. What that means is that 24 hours a day, continuously, the premises is being watched over. So if an alarm has to be sent, including a, a malicious line cut, that will be sent through within seconds to the alarm company, who can then call out the police or whatever. What I'd like to do is hand over to Bob Tuck, who will very briefly explain how the network works and show what happens when we have to send an alarm message. Thank you, Vicky. Well, as you can see on this demonstration panel here, we've got the representation of a typical uh, customer's premises with a control panel with the actual red care equipment installed inside it. That is connected to a normal BT telephone line, as you can see here, down the BT cables into the local telephone exchange. This is where we actually site our red care equipment. That equipment is then connected back via separated links to our main host computers in secure separate locations. To monitor the whole of, whole of the network, we have what's called our red care network control, which you can see at the top here. The purpose of this is to oversee control of the network and to make sure all components are working properly and to effect speedy repair on uh, any part that doesn't. On the output of the host computers are the alarm companies monitoring links. These go down to the different alarm companies and we can see a representation here on this screen. Let's see how the system works then. Normal telephone line then with the customer in their premises. If the customer then presses their panic button, the signal will then go up to the control panel and be transmitted down the phone line to the equipment in the exchange. That will then be transmitted on to the host computers and it then comes up to the alarm company screen. As we can see here, as a panic alarm on the demonstration we see in front of us. Importantly, the alarm companies must acknowledge receipt of every alarm they receive over the network. This is to make sure that the alarm is always acted upon. Once we reset the alarm, the system again goes through the same sequence of transmitting the message down the normal BT line through the network again, and this time it comes up and actually resets the alarm. I'll just uh, reset the alarm there. And as we can see, the reset has come through. Again, the central station has to acknowledge that reset. Well now, Clear the screen down, demonstrate the other sequence on the red care network, which is the continuous monitoring down the phone line. What we'll actually do is do a malicious line cut on the phone line. This has now disconnected the equipment from the exchange to the equipment and the customer's premises. The signal cannot get through, and in this sequence, we, we will then see a line break come up down to the central station screen. The equipment in the exchange, though, is continuously trying to reset and re-establish contact with the equipment of the customer's premises. And what we will now see is, once the line is restored, the, the scanning equipment in the exchange will now re-establish contact with the equipment of the customer's premises. And that will then be transmitted through as a line break, as a line restored coming up on the screen. So that means that the equipment is now working properly again right through the network. This is one of the major benefits of the Telecom Red system, having the continuous line monitoring over the BT line. Thank you, Bob. It's easy to have Red Care installed, and we suggest that you contact any reputable alarm company to find out more about it. However, if you'd like literature or more information, we have a free phone number, 0800 800 828, where very easy questions can be answered and literature can be sent to you. Thank you, Vicky and Bob. And if you want further inquiries, please note that number. You can also get details from your local crime prevention officer at your local police station. Now back to the crimes. Between 6 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. on Monday, the 8th of November, 
the following person was responsible for stealing a TV video unit and computer printer from East Barks College, Boyne Hill, Maidenhead. He was a white male, mid-twenties, five foot six inches tall, slim build with dark brown hair. He was wearing paint-covered jeans, a dark t-shirt and a lumber jacket style top. Do you know the offender or did you see him in the area at that time? Please let us know. Between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m. on Wednesday the 3rd of November, the following property was stolen from Holy Trinity Church in Cookham during the evening service. It's an oriental rug, size 10 feet by 6 feet, with a tree of life design on it. The picture gives some idea of the type of rug. If you're at the church and can give any information or you know where the rug is, we would like to hear from you. And finally, between 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. on Friday the 12th of November, a burglary occurred at Winkfield Row when £30,000 worth of property was taken, including a safe. Now, the safe was recovered on Sunday the 14th of November in Colnway, Raysbury, near the Weir. As you may guess, it was empty. Witnesses remember seeing a white breakdown truck or similar at 4 a.m. on that Sunday morning in this area. The truck had an amber warning light on its roof. Any information? we gratefully received. Once again, if you have any information regarding any of these crimes or any other crime, then please call our crime line on 0753 506 922 and this will be shown on your screens. Failing that, you can give the information to any police station. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again next month. Thank you, Paul. If you could help with any of these items, don't forget that the Moving Magazine service is available 24 hours a day with the appropriate telephone numbers. Now, let's try and help the police, especially with the attacks on the elderly. I think we've all heard quite enough reports on that. Let's hear reports about the police catching these thugs and, with your help, putting them away for a very long time. On a lighter note, Tony O'Rourke's balls have been changing shape for a few weeks. We've had golf, football and rugby. Now they're getting smaller and lighter. Yes, it's table tennis. Here's Tony. Thank you, Steve. This week I'm at the Windsor and Maidenhead District Sports Association for the Disabled, where I've been joined by John Jenkins, who's the chairman of WAMSAD, and Jeff Mason, who's the social club chairman. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Hi. John, uh, first of all, tell us what's it all about. What is WAMSAD, what is WAMSAD about? WAMSAD? WAMSAD is a sports club. I mean, beyond everything, we are a sports club, and uh, it happens that uh, we provide sporting facilities for disabled people as opposed to able-bodied people. What so, sort of uh, sports do what, you offer? Uh, we provide all sorts of sports, very diverse sports, to a very wide membership in terms of young and old um, throughout the Royal Borough of Windsor and, Tab uh, Windsor and Maidenhead, um, from rowing to track and field events, archery, shot put, discus, javelin, shooting, swimming, a whole range of uh, sports that we, that we embark upon, not only from here in the uh, from the Wamsad Clubhouse and the and Braywick playing field, um, but also down at the Magnet Pool, uh, the Magnet Leisure Centre in Maidenhead, where we uh, swim every Sunday night. We've got a, we've got very strong swimming section, very strong table tennis section. We've got some of the best archers in the country, and a very very strong shooting section. And we do a whole host of other sports as well. Mm -hmm. How many members have you got now? We've got around about um, 120 members, um, some very young from five or six year old, right the way through to uh, octogenarians, um, and cater for all types of disability, from paraplegics, amputees, blind, deaf, a whole host of disabilities that you wouldn't even recognize. So the, the only criteria for joining is that you, you've got to want to play sport? The whole the criteria of full membership is uh, that you're a disabled person and you want to participate in sport. Importantly, sport for leisure and pleasure, as well as sport at the highest level, you know, at the highest level of excellence, Olympic level, world championship level. And we cater for the whole spectrum of sporting activities in between. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're very, very much supported by able-bodied people who actually join our club to actually just support us and help us in the sports that we do. Um, and also many of them who are drinking members of our club, here for social 
um, activities who support us um, not only in terms of what they do but also in terms of uh, financially as well which is very important to us. Mm -hmm. And Jeff, you're the chairman of the, the social club. Tell us about the, the social aspect. Well, certainly in the social club, we've got something like 250 members. John talks about them as drinking members. I'm not sure they'd agree <laughs> with that. We don't have an enormous bar turnover. We have a regular turnover. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, we're involving able-bodied people with disabled people, uh, assisting in sport and the social leisure aspect of the club and even more importantly of course fundraising mm -hmm. well, what does it cost to join very cheap really um, although it's arguable amongst our members we only charge three pounds it's a registration fee rather than a membership fee and for that you get a magazine four times a year mm -hmm. and you learn all about the social and sporting events that have happened as well as what will happen in the uh, future Mm -hmm. And so if, if you did want to join, how do you go about that? Is there a telephone number to ring? Yes, you can ring the clubhouse any evening on 27690, that's Maidenhead. Uh, there's always somebody will take your name, your telephone number, and pass you our very comprehensive membership package full of information and rather exciting reading. <laughs> and that goes for uh, disabled and able. Oh, certainly, people, right? certainly, yes. We like to tell everybody exactly what the club does uh, and how we do it. Okay, well thank you very much gentlemen for coming on to tell us about that. If you are interested in joining yourself then you can call as uh, Jeff said on 0628, that's the code and the number is 27690. 0628 27690, that's evenings. Steve. Thank you Tony. More sport in just a moment after the break and an expert in the studio. Steve Williams coming up. Whatever you're looking for to furnish your home, look no further than the... Within our giant store on the Bath Road, Sippenham, the choice just has to be seen to be believed. Just look at the names we have under one roof. And with interest-free credit on some items, this is the ideal place. Whatever your taste, whatever your style, there's only one place to come. 388 to 389 Bath Road, just off Junction 7. It's the ideal... Welcome back. Here's Steve Brennan. Welcome back. As you know, we're a sporting lot here at WMTV and especially on Scene on 7. We have a sporting expert in the studio with us today. His name is Steve Williams. He's the South West Division Press Officer for the Rugby Football Union. Steve, welcome to the studio. Thank you, Steve. I understand you've been to Twickenham lately. Yes, indeed, we have. We've been up to Twickenham a few weeks ago uh, to meet up with the president of the uh, Rugby Football Union, that's Ian Deer. But before we do that, of course, the uh, Courage Club's championship is now in full swing with all our local sides in the WMTV area in action. Most of the sides now have played four games. So let's, before we go up to Twickenham, let's take a look at the positions in the current uh, league tables of the Courage Club's championship. And it's a bit of a tale of woe, I'm afraid. Let's start with Southwest Division One. And Maidenhead currently languishing bottom of Southwest Division One, the only club without a point in four games. Henley, the uh, tearaway leaders. And it's the same story in Southwest Two, with Windsor well and truly stuck to the bottom and like Maidenhead without a point from four games. So a lot of hard work to do for both those clubs. In Southern Counties, a much better start for Slough this season, two wins from four games and lying eighth. On to the Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire divisions and a mediocre start for both Drifters and Panamians, just below mid-table. Both have three points from four, Drifters with the better points difference in eighth, Panamians ninth. Now take a look at Division 2, and Phoenix really on a flyer. Don't forget, because of the number of sides in the league, they play home and away. But look at that, Phoenix played 7, won all 7 for 234 points and conceding just 19. But even so, only two points ahead of Buckingham. Moving on to the London and South East Divisions, and Staines again showing they mean business in London 3 Northwest. 
They are, are currently second, two points behind unbeaten Letchworth with three wins out of four. And finally, in Hertfordshire Middlesex Division 1, a reasonable start by Uxbridge, currently ninth with two points, but having played only three games. Well, of course, plenty of time for all our clubs to do better yet. Uh, they all play 12 games in the season, so not to panic yet for the likes of Maidenhead and Windsor. As I said uh, earlier on, we're off to Twickenham now because earlier I took a camera crew to the hallowed domains of Twickenham, the headquarters of the Rugby Football Union, to meet up with its president, Ian Beer. And uh, when we stepped out onto that hallowed turf at Twickenham, it took my breath away, I must admit. And it was uh, one of the first things that we had to remark on is all the new facilities up at Twickenham. Well, Ian, it's not even finished, is it, yet? But, I mean, you still get a magnificent feel when you walk into uh, the new look Twickenham. It's fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely Brilliant. tremendous. I think we're all very proud of it. Superb. And uh, with a bit of imagination, if you imagine what it's going to be like when it's right wrap around Absolutely. one day. A tremendous theatre for the game. Yes, it is. Mm. A great year for you, of course. Uh, just become taken over as president, and uh, for anybody in the rugby union to become president, uh, that's what you're striving for in all, all your terms of office. Right. When I ran on this field, I didn't realise whenever it was 40 years ago that I'd be president of the union, but uh, it's a great privilege. It certainly is. What are your aims for your year in presidency in office? Well, uh, the first thing is that I want to do everything I can to allow everybody to have some fun, exactly. because that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. But having said that, of course, we've got some problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first thing is, is to make certain that all our clubs behave themselves in terms of not inducing players to move from one league to another. So trying to encourage all clubs to sign the compliance regulations to prevent illegal payments, that's the first thing. The second thing is I believe that the way the committee is organised and the way the committee in the rugby union is selected may now be a little bit out of date and so we've got a group together who are going to look at that and we've got a couple of independent people mm -hmm. looking at it to cast their eyes on it and thirdly i have been responsible for trying to prevent injury in rugby and with the number of people playing the number of people who get serious injury is very small i mean it's much mm. much smaller than getting in a motor car or anything but we do sadly get one or two who break their necks and they're in wheelchairs and i don't think we've done enough to look after them so, in this great stadium, when we play New Zealand, I'm going to ask everybody in this stadium to put their hands in their pockets and put money into the new Spire Fund, support paraplegics in rugby enterprise. And I'm going to ask every school and every club in the land to spend their weekend raising money for the ones who are in wheelchairs. I mean, you're all right, you walk right. around. Yeah. So you're going to pay up. I will. And Thank when you. is it? What weekend? 27th, 28th of November. Right. And I've already got 100,000 we've raised, Brilliant. so we'll be way over the million and everything by the time we finish. What about two million? <laughs> well, let's go back to the first point you made about uh, players' inducement by clubs. I mean, is it a serious problem? It is potentially a very serious problem, I think, yes. Because if one club starts doing it, then the only way out of it is for the next club to start doing it. And then the next club, and it's a domino effect, and it gets worse and worse. And this is why I'm so delighted that the senior clubs themselves want to see what we can do to prevent it. Because if you can stop it, then everybody is still then uh, playing from the same base. But if you start uh, trying to give somebody a motor car and this kind of thing, then it will just reverberate right the way down through the whole game. Uh, but I th if the will is there among the clubs in our land to make certain that we don't go along that line, then I think we can get rid of it. It's the problem. I mean, the England are, if you are entrenched in their amateur view point, but it's not really so in the southern hemisphere, is it? We're hearing so much about players being paid and whatever, so that, um, you know, you're battling against that all the time. We are battling against it, and it's one of the reasons why, first of all, we've got to make certain that in our own country we're not being hypocritical, that we know what's happening and we're controlling what's happening. We can then go into battle on the international board, uh, strong and with courage, to tackle other countries 
who may be paying their players. And do let us remember, the international board now is huge. There's hardly a country in the world that doesn't play rugby. Which countries are paying players? And the answer is very, very few. But, you, but you're not opposed to a player uh, making it bob or two if he can from other ways other than playing I'm the game? I'm not only not opposed to it, I would encourage it. And we're doing all we can through our discussions with the players to help the players to make money off the field and to make money which otherwise would not be coming into rugby football. I think what a lot of people don't realise is that, for example, every child who runs onto the rugby fields can be insured against injury by the Rugby Football Union Charitable Trust Fund, the Wavell Wakefield Trust, so that we are protecting and helping the, the kids the whole time. We are financing, sometimes with the help of the local authorities, 40 youth development offices throughout the country. Our coaching scheme is the envy of the entire world. Now, if you start taking the money out and giving it to the players the whole time, all that will collapse because there isn't enough money in rugby football to do both things. And even the current players, they say very positively, they do not wish to be paid for running on the field. But they would like to be paid, of course, for opening a supermarket right. or making a speech at a dinner. And I'm all for that, and we want to help them to do that. Ian, thanks very much indeed for taking the time to talk to us and enjoy your year. I shall enjoy it if all the players enjoy it. That's the key. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I still think rugby's a tough game and I don't know why they do it, but there we are. Some newspapers rely mainly on pages of script and long detailed analysis to tell you a story. Others work on the principle that a picture, or in this case a photograph, can paint a thousand words. Here's a profile of press photographer Gary Trotter. Well, being, being a, a kind of Cold War kiddie, I've grown up all my life being told that there were these people in the East that we should all be terrified of. Um, and I think I was aware that something like the Berlin Wall wasn't going to be there forever. So I went to see, I, I didn't kind of predict that it was going to come down, but I, I had a feeling that it wasn't going to be around forever. I wanted to see it for myself and, and meet these people. I mean, I, I'd never actually met, you know, an East German or a Russian or whatever, these, these you know, supposedly terrible people who lived on the other side of the wall. So I wanted to see what was on the other side of the wall. You know, I'd seen Richard Burton and, and stuff in films, and it was all very kind of atmospheric and, uh, you know, so certainly a bit of danger, so, supposedly. And I just wanted to go and check it out, see if it was, see if it was really like that. Uh, you used to be able to go through from Checkpoint Charlie, because the, the underground in Berlin was built be before the wall went up, uh, the, the underground there would go under the wall. Now, the East, when it was East Germany, the East Germans didn't use the underground. So all their stations were left from World War II. But you used to go to a place called Friedrichstrasse in East Berlin and you could change trains and go back out to the West. And then technically you were still in the West, although you were in the heart of East Berlin. And uh, they took a dislike because they had too many cameras when we were changing trains. They said, you can't possibly be a tourist, you've got two cameras and the lenses are a bit too big. And uh, it's quite bizarre, because the, the East German soldiers' uniforms used to be the same as, as what most people would imagine World War II German uniforms are like, except for the helmets. And uh, these guys came like stomping down the platform. It's, you know, rouse, rouse, chanel, chanel. And it really was like something out of the, you know, the Great Escape or something. And these guys were like jabbing guns and no photographs. And, trying to explain to them that I didn't take any pictures of the station. And the guy I was with, Steve, um, he didn't speak any German and he was terrified. And my biggest worry actually was that he was going to run away. I said, <laughs> you know, I tried to off these guys. I, I was really trying hard to remember O-level German, um, which I did at school, and, you know, what's German for, you know, don't shoot me. Um, but uh, we got away with it in the end. They, they held the train up for about half an hour, but we got away with it in the end. Well, I went down to Greenham Common again, um, living in this area. Green Common was, at the time was quite quite a big story going on, and they had, they had this day of protest where they were going to go around and uh, basically surround the whole base with people protesting nuclear weapons. Now, you know, most people would probably agree nuclear weapons aren't one of our best ideas ever, and I fancied to go. You know, I want to go and see this for myself again, and by this time I'd already met some people from East Berlin, etc., etc., and. Um, you know, they're just people, they're just people. So I was, I was quite in favour of these things going. And when I got down there, 
there was uh, signs on the fences and policemen watching us, watching them, watching us, saying, you know, cameras forbidden, uh, no photography, no sketching, which I thought was kind of crazy. No sketching, you know. I mean, when Goth's going to turn up and sketch the missiles? But um, <laughs> you can you imagine these Russians with their crayons? And I just thought, well, I don't really like this much. I don't really like being told no. Basically, you know, it's not it's not allowed. You, know, you very rarely see signs saying this is allowed. You know. And I thought, well, what, you know, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? Charge me with taking pictures of a fence? You know. Um, so I just ignored it and. Somebody took a picture of me giving uh, my response to the sign. <laughs> I find getting fired is always a very healthy thing to be done. It's, uh, getting, getting the boot from the Slow Express was the big, biggest thing that probably that moved me forward. Thank you very much for sacking me. Um, and yeah, it, it gave me a freedom to, to pursue what I really wanted to do um, by being shoved in a deep end, really, I think. It was like, you know, one minute you had a job, next minute you didn't. And I still had bills to pay, so. Uh, well, what I, what I did was I just started phoning all the national newspapers and I, must, I was quite lucky because I think I got fired on a Thursday or a Friday and on the Monday I managed to get a picture which was in about four or five of the national newspapers on the front page. I think it was a murder somewhere. Um, so that, that was kind of a bit of a lucky break. It, well, my, my biggest interest would probably be is the, the human condition uh, and that doesn't mean it has to, it doesn't have to be you know, particularly violent or spectacular. Sometimes it can be relatively, you know, what on the surface seems to be quite mundane. Mm. Um, and, you know, characters, people's faces, people's reactions, catching people unaware, I'm much more interested in, in that side of things. And uh, I think, you know, you can, you can tell a lot about people, mm. this kind of stuff. Fair, yeah, this was, I mean, this was lucky for me in, in financial terms. What happened was, um, I was, I was called up to do some pictures at Windsor Safari Park and then told that nothing, nothing was happening. But lots of people uh, had ties on. But when people comb their hair and have ties on and, and clean shoes, it only means somebody's coming. So um, I, I stuck around Safari Park and Fergie showed up with Beatrice. And uh, I basically followed them around for a while, waited until they got out of their car and then went up and approached them, and uh, she was actually fine. I mean, you know, normally fine in those situations. If you do it the right way, they're OK. And I think it was only, because it was only me, she didn't, she didn't mind if there'd been a big pack. But um, I've, these, these pictures do leave me a bit uneasy as well, because at the moment, there's, there's a kind of upside-down logic, uh, particularly in Fleet Street, in that I could take pictures like this, which took an hour. It took me an hour. I was home for lunch. Um, and they owed me somewhere in the region of £10,000 for what is basically a mum and her kid at the zoo. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> they're not doing anything particularly spectacular here. Um, whereas, as you say, you, I think for covering the, the entire Gulf War in Tel Aviv, I've received something in the region of about £5,000, which I had to be, you know, scattered missiles fired me every night. <laughs> Looks like an exciting life and quite interesting, but I think it's safer here. Now, would you like to appear on WMTV yourself? Well, it's your chance on December the 11th. I'll be in Slough around the Observatory Shopping Centre with a film crew from about 11 o'clock in the morning, and we'll be recording your Christmas messages, which we will transmit over the Christmas and New Year period. So come along, we'll have some fun and some prizes to give away, and one very special prize to meet the most popular man in the country. Can you guess who it is? That will be in the studio here at WMTV the following week. So, see you at the observatory at 11 o'clock, Saturday morning, December the 11th. Update on 7 has a poignant message this week. December the 1st is World AIDS Day. And my special guest earlier was Dr. Sean Waldron.
Sean, if we go back to 1981, it seems that AIDS was first recognized in California um, at that time. Is that accurate? It was around that time that the constellation, the group of problems which we now define as AIDS, was recognized as being part of a particular grouping rather than just individual occurrences of odd diseases which have been recognized before that time. So yes, at that time, AIDS was recognized as a, a specific entity. So it would seem, therefore, to the average man in the street that um, if you can find the origin of the disease, by, by its very nature, you should very well probably be able to find a cure. Therefore, why has AZT and some of the other drugs, for example, not been able to halt the spread of the disease? The difficulty is that the cause of the AIDS problem has been recognized to be, in most people's minds, HIV infection, which is a viral infection. And at the moment, scientifically and medically more important, there is no cure for viral illnesses as such. There are methods of controlling them. And it's in this, in particular, that medical attempts have concentrated, and so far unsuccessfully, because each virus behaves quite differently. And the other major way of controlling that is through vaccines, which again, for reasons to do with the nature of HIV, have proved very difficult to develop and test and prove benefits. So $65 million question, how near are we finding a cure for AIDS? I think the approach is more towards controlling the infection and attempting to prevent its spread rather than curing it at the moment. But the hope is that with scientific advance, prospects of cure of will arrive. And lots of research. And lots yes. of money thrown at it. Estimates put the number of people infected by AIDS at between 10 and 12 million worldwide. What can be done to um, halt the spread of this disease? I think what is being done and needs to continue being done is to make people aware of it, aware of the ease with which it can be transmitted, the variety of ways in which it can be transmitted, and the fact that it doesn't go away, and that there are many, many people who are quite healthy in any population, but perhaps more so in different populations, who will carry this virus for many years unknown to themselves unless they take a test and be potentially infectious to other people. If someone is unfortunate enough to be diagnosed as HIV positive, how likely is it that they'll develop full-blown AIDS? For the present, we have to presume that anyone who is unfortunate enough to be infected with this virus may develop AIDS. We cannot say that everyone who is HIV positive will, and in the nature of viral illnesses, most illnesses don't affect everyone in the same way, but unfortunately with HIV up to now followed for long enough more and more people do become ill and that process may continue so eventually perhaps everyone infected may develop illness but we have to presume that everyone with HIV could become ill and they need to pay attention to their health as if that might be the case. On the subject of um, HIV and the test for it what does the test actually comprise of? People have a a kind of a mis misapprehension about what's involved there. What does the test actually comprise? I think the most important two parts of the test are number one, the fact that it needs to be given not just in a random way, but in a very carefully controlled, counseled type of way by some, or supervised by someone who knows something about the infection and can advise the individual wanting the test about why they want it, what the likely outcome might be, how they might cope with such an outcome before they even consider the test. But the test itself is actually just a simple blood test. A simple blood test. And the anal analysis for it is different. Well, the analysis is similar to the analysis for many other infections, but it's specific for that particular virus. It's a very simple test to do. The delay that often occurs between testing and getting the result is simply to do with laboratory time commitments rather than with the difficulty of the test. Um, and all the test does is diagnose the presence of this virus in the person's body, nothing more than that. It's World AIDS Day on December the 1st. Um, what are the aims of, of what has now become, a, literally, a global event? Well, the aim, I think, has to be predominantly to keep people's minds alerted to the presence of this danger. Uh, because given the nature of the infection, it is, again, something that remains dormant for so long. People may presume that the condition is going away, whereas, in fact, it is not it's going to remain with us. It's going to be a constant danger to whole populations and to individuals. And the more we can alert people's minds in a recurring way to this perennial problem, to this ongoing problem, the better.
the difficulty is that w once a, an infection like this becomes established in a population and then becomes relatively stable, people may forget that it's a constant threat to their health. They need the, to be reminded. the government has spent millions on advertising, making people aware of AIDS uh, and research, of course. Is it enough and, and has it worked? I think you'd have to say that in a very simple, uh, on a very simple level, the money spent has been spent well in that from a general population point of view, I think there can be very few people who are not aware of the presence of HIV. It needs to continue to spread the information that this, while it's not a, let's say, major risk for every individual, is a risk for every individual, and they need to be aware of how they can avoid such risks. On the subject of the government and money once again, um, dare I mention the NHS cuts. Everybody's painfully aware of um, the, the inroads that's made into the NHS. Um, how is that affecting the care of, of the unfortunate people who contract AIDS? I think for the moment, the um, financial support for care of HIV infection and for its prevention through education and so on is quite, um, quite reasonable in, in, in many ways. The difficulty is that with time, it may become more difficult to keep that finance, financial commitment from the government as it is now. And I think it is up to each individual and each group involved in care of HIV and education regarding HIV to keep pressure on the um, department, on the government, on whatever the authority may be to continue to finance this difficult illness and at the moment quite financially demanding illness as it is now being financed. That's about all we've got time for, Sean, I'm afraid, but thank you very much for coming in and good luck with everything you do at the Hillingdon Hospital. Right. Thank, thank you very you. much. A serious subject, but one I think you'll agree is very worthwhile putting in the program. I would like to say a very special thank you to Dr. Sean Waldron for taking the time out of his busy clinic at the Hillingdon Hospital to join me in the studio. The Slough Tennis Centre, by the way, are taking part in World AIDS Day by hosting a round-robin event on December the 12th. Indoor tennis and all proceeds are going to charity. The entrance fee is £15 per player, so if you'd like to take part, please call Slough Indoor Tennis Centre on 0753 875587. This number will be on the moving magazine. In the first instance, contact Ross Van Nen. OK, back in just a moment after this break with Simon Brandt. Power. Power. Electrical installations for your working environment. Controls. Control systems for air conditioning, heating and ventilation. Communications. Communications for voice and data networks. Power controls communications from concept to completion. Think pens down on 0474 853 2. For your holiday away from the crowds, our nine bedroom villa has its own swimming pool, tennis court and billiards room and is available for room or whole villa rental. Situated on the Portuguese west coast, three minutes from the beach, with three golf courses within 40 minutes drive. And of course, there's the renowned Portuguese food. For brochure or video, call Eaton Travel on 0753 671747. Now back to the studio with Scene on 7. <laughs> OK, well, I'm afraid Grapevine's gone, as you probably know. Last week was the very last Grapevine. But you can guess who's coming next. It's no illusion. It's Simon Brandt with a very special guest. Thank you, Steve. Yes, with me is the country's top illusionist, Wayne Dobson. He's here in Windsor. Wayne, welcome to um, Scene on Seth. Nice to have you here in it's Windsor. nice to be here as well. Nice what tie, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> very nice tie. Um, what can we expect to see at uh, the Mirage? We see all these illusions behind me. Uh -huh. They've disappeared at the moment. Right. <laughs> we are actually doing a lot of illusions uh -huh. on the show. And um, some, well, would, would the ones that you'll see, you will have never seen before anything right. like it. So it's, uh, and we're very pleased to be here. You know, it's, uh -huh. uh, it's going to be nice because normally I work with people just right in front of me. Sure. But I've got them on all sides yeah. here, so I've got to, got to watch my uh, butt. For a television audience. Yeah. 
presumably you do have to have a completely different angle um, compared to, uh, say, a live atmosphere at the There moment. are certain things I do on TV that, mm. that I couldn't do live, like I vanished the helicopter on no, TV, sure, but I can't do that same. live because you can't get a helicopter <laughs> in it. So that is the only reason, mm. but I don't actually... Um, uh, specify that I can do something just for television because mm. people think well it's just a television sure. trick and then you get accused of using a camera mm. trick and I don't use camera tricks right. it's, the, it's the biggest form of flattery I can uh -huh. receive yeah. saying something is a camera trick because sure. it means it's perfect I suppose mm. I don't use one because I think a camera trick you can tell there's always a jump in frame and mm. there's always a dissolve magic is not like that it doesn't it doesn't happen like that that's why all the best directors in the world whenever they want to create a magical effect on a film, mm. they still use an old magical principle, you know, they, they, they always. You know, what, what advice have you got for, say, somebody who's 10 years old, yeah. heavily into um, their magic kit at home, yes. but they want to go further? What advice Books, have you got? read. I would mm. say read uh, is the best source of information and learn the, learn the basics and the elementary uh, magic first and then, then you can always... Uh, it, some people I know, they want to learn illusions straight away. Well, they don't have any... They don't have any um, background yeah. knowledge into the elementary You've got to do part. the grafting You must, before, because right? it's, you know, the old saying, it's not what you put into the performance, it's what you leave out. Sure. And if you, if you, uh, you know, if you leave out um, what is no good, then you've got a good performance. But if you don't know what is no good, then you'll never know what to leave out. Wayne, thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Scene on 7. It's a pleasure. I look um, forward to you. Are you going to come and see this Hopefully. Show? Yeah, bring yeah. Steve. You know Steve with a tie. <laughs> He's a nice man, isn't he? Uh, he very nice he man. Comes along. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but seriously, all the best for December. OK. And um, hopefully see you again soon on uh, WMTV. Thank you very much. Now back to uh, Mr Brennan. Very nice. Even Wayne Dobson is talking about my ties now. Incidentally, thank you, Wayne, for the invite to the show. You all heard it, and I'm definitely going. Wayne is appearing at the Mirage Club from the 2nd of December until New Year's Eve. Tickets, including an a la carte meal and disco, are £25, and there are still a few left. You can call the Mirage in Windsor on 0753 856 222. That's 0753 856 222. See you there. If you have any comments on the programme or there's anything you'd like to see included, please write to us at our new address, which is... Scene on 7, WMTV... P.O. Box 7, Slough, Berkshire, SL3, 6ET. That's about it for this week. Hope you've enjoyed the programme. I'll see you next week for Scene on 7 and WMTV. I'm Steve Brennan. Bye-bye. <laughs>